Hello everybody, Dr. Blue here, and welcome to the Prey Blue Review. At the request of some friends, I'm going to try and keep this review spoiler-free as much as I can. However, at the end, I will have to talk about the story because it's a big part of the game, but I will warn you beforehand. But anyway, let's move on to the first impressions. So, upon playing this game for the opening hour that we got, it did feel a lot like a horror game at first. There were so many things that could be hiding, there could be mimics amongst the props, ready to jump out of you and suck out your life essence. And that sense of fear was really installed in me from the very start. This would be changing as the game went on because it became more action-oriented, but that isn't necessarily a bad thing. They let everyone play the first opening hour of this thing for free, and it was a really good tactic to get people to buy the game. It got me interested anyway. So, what did this game do well? Well, as I already mentioned, the horror aspect in the beginning of the game was very good. But as you got to identify enemies with your psychoscope, it became less scary and more about action which defeated this game's horror aspect and steered towards being more of an action game. Not dissimilar from The Evil Within, and I still gave The Evil Within a 7, so keep your hopes high, folks. I definitely liked that I could rescue fellow scientists among the station, and I also had the option to kill them. There are achievements for killing everyone on the station or saving everyone, but I think it definitely shows the choice option in this game. For instance, you can choose to save or kill Dr. Igwe, and saving him opens up so many more options to save many more people. Doing good resulted in you being able to do more good, and I liked it. Don't worry, ma'am. I'm saving you. Yeah! Oh, at last. oh thank you. Yes! Okay, sweet. Yay, I saved Igwe. Okay, sweet. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Worked in the simulation lab and in psychotronics. He might be helpful, but he's unlikely to approve of your mission, despite everything he's suffered. Though I will note, he's always admired you and Alex quite a bit. Okay, great. Awesome. Junk in this game was also useful. Spare weapons, banana peels, even crumpled paper, all could be recycled. It gave the game a real sense of survival and desperation, especially when ammo was low, to pick up everything you could find. Everything had a purpose, and finding those ammo stashes were golden opportunities that you didn't want to miss. Now, can we please talk about the spacewalks? Oh my god, I loved them. You, you had a fast travel system, that wasn't a fast travel system. Navigating the outside of the station was its own little area littered with corpses and people trapped in cargo containers. Igwe, I'm looking at you. And it even had its own enemies out there too. It was a great way to get around and most importantly, it was an immersive way to get around quickly. There is a subtle beauty to the Prey fast travel system. First. Oh, it's like a fast it's like travel system. That is clever, I like that. That is very clever. They've used kind of a spacewalk thing as a fast travel, so I've just unlocked a fast travel location. That is clever. That is a clever use of that, and a, w a good way to kind of implement the fast travel system in an immersive way. I do like that. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Congrats, Bethesda. That was, that was clever. I like that. Also, when you're outside in space, it felt cool to stumble upon people that were dead outside. It felt like that scene from Star Wars The Force Unleashed when Vader's robot finds your corpse and brings you back. Just shining the light on their face, learning their identity and who they were before they became this lifeless corpse before you. I have to say, the spacewalks were truly incredible. And when you happened upon these corpses and you scanned them and you could identify who they were, you could find everyone on this station through the tracker and whether they were alive or dead. And you could log their status on the ship's computer and use it to track down the ones you hadn't yet found and the ones still alive. There was also the fact that mimics could be anything in this game and it definitely kept you on your toes in the beginning of the game. But as I said, it sort of faded away as we went throughout the game, and although they did get the jump on me a couple of times, it did kind of lose the horror aspect. This game reminded me a lot of Bioshock, a game which I loved and oh so sorely miss. And this game kind of mimicked, pun intended, Bioshock. They had things like audio logs detailing people's lives and conversations before the invasion. It gave an ambience to the station, realising that people used to be alive here. 
it set the atmosphere for the game and there were little scenes like a little glue snowman hidden behind some boxes in an office. A bit of an office joke for everyone. And you could almost relive their lives through their emails and the terminals they left behind. It was cute and sad at the same time knowing that these people were so joyful but they were gone. Uh, Mr. Gluey McGlueface Arms aka First Shift. Where? <laughs> Oh, oh, that's perfect. Gluey McGlue face. Sorry, Gluey. I uh, I kind of need the stuff that's in you right now. <laughs> I like that. That's cool. That's great. I like that. Little office kind of gag. I like that. I like it. It gives kind of personality to the people who were here before, you know what I mean? I do like it. And then on to enemies like phantoms who were resurrected from the corpses of our own dead and given their names. They felt like the terrorized souls of the lost dead tormented by the weaver's summoning of them. Recreated to fight those they once worked with and it was, it was kind of sad but almost gratifying sometimes to be putting them out of their misery and letting them rest. With subtitles on, we could also sometimes see their messages like they were trying to communicate to us, but through the audio, we couldn't understand them because they had almost no language of their own. It's kind of sad, really. These people were killed and fighting their own people that they used to call friends, and they couldn't even say to them that they were sorry. Okay, there we go. Oh, God. The fact that they can take over people and people can become these things is just... Oh, God. The glue gun is arguably the most useful tool I have ever fucking used in any game ever. A path builder used to get into those hard to reach areas where if you were clever enough, and often enough I felt like I was, you could find some hidden stashes and it was often rewarding when you found alternate pathways for yourself. The game rewarded you for being clever and I liked it. Is there any way to get in there? There seems to be a way above, maybe. And I can make a way with my trusty glue cannon. Just, just freeze in place, please. Come on. You can do it. It can't stick to itself, apparently. Okay, let's make one on the floor. Here we go. It's awkward that it can't stick to itself. Okay, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. Um, here we go. Hey, I'm a regular old Thaddeus York, look at me. It's not perfect, but it's something. Hey, what is up? Yeah! And I liked that there was a set of alien powers that you could take advantage of, and they looked pretty incredible. The only hole I would poke in that though is that the game says if you use them you'll be punished, so you almost feel obligated not to touch them, which I didn't, but they look so cool. A point I will bring up later in the spoiler section because that's kind of related to the story. And the game really stayed true to your character, so Morgan Yu is a scientist, right? And of course he can handle all these weapons, but being that scientist often helps you out so you can like scan enemies to learn their weaknesses, and you can use the knowledge to use recyclers and fabricators. You're a scientist fighting against an outbreak on your station, and you used everything at your disposal to fight back, which again, really pushes this sense of desperation and this Bioshock aspect of everything. Trying to save a lost city. One thing I did really like as well was the game adapted to situations, like for instance when I was bringing the pressure regulator to the cook in the kitchen. I already had it and he had voice lines ready and waiting for that happenstance. The game thought ahead of time, you could tell they really focused on choice in this game. We have food, but no water. This pressure regulator, it is I mean that's all well and good, but I picked one out of you, you off until fixed. You can find a replacement part in the greenhouse, I think. With water, we can dig for rescue. No water? Huh. Do Thank this thing, I'll let you into freezer. That's where I hit all the puppets the beasts sent first. Maybe they have useful things You got people you. in there. No? You seem a bit freaky, man. I ain't gonna, uh, ain't gonna lie. And you? How do you have this already? You are thinking in front of time? Yeah, a little bit. 
There was also a feature I personally liked, which was the Typhon would reinfest areas of the station, sometimes changing them completely and leaving Coral in their wake. And it made the Typhon seem like this really unstoppable force that you could not eradicate. It really made you think that, is blowing up the station the right choice? Would it truly rid us of this Typhon, but at what cost? Another thing that made you very wary when travelling the station was that there were Typhon we knew nothing about yet. Or if we did, we knew very little. For instance, the Nightmare that was this big Typhon that we never encountered before, and it seems its only purpose was to try and kill us. And it did add a little scare factor to the game when it first came in, but after we learned that it could die and we could kill it, it became a little less scary. Motherfucker. Ah, what the fuck? What the hell? Oh, what the fuck? Oh, oh, what the fuck? Oh, that's so big. Oh my god, what is it? A fucking nightmare? Dude, what the hell? What the fuck? Right, stop for a sec, stop for a sec. I'll come repair you back in a minute. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Okay, okay, okay. Come back online, help me, help me, help me. Okay. Oh my god, it's fucking huge. Oh shit, get inside. Okay, what the fuck? Oh god, that's coming for me. Can I drink alcohol? Make the fear go away? Oh god. Oh shit. Oh god. Oh, there's a fucking nightmare thing coming for me. Oh my god, what the fuck? Now, what is there that's bad about this game? Well... What the hell did you do to that thing, Mitchell? It sounds like an Auntie Waffle commercial. This voice line glitch in the cafeteria scene drove me a little bit crazy. It's just something that I think needs fixing. I don't think it's Will Mitchell's actually Will Mitchell, you know? Sounds like an anti waffle commercial. What the hell did you do to that thing, Mitchell? Sounds like an anti waffle commercial. This guy ain't, uh. He's not Will Mitchell, he's someone else. Sounds like an anti waffle commercial. He ain't Will Mitchell. What the hell did you do to that thing, Mitchell? Sounds like an anti waffle commercial. Can we stop playing that, please? What's that sound, man? Sorry if you guys can hear the guys outside. They are quite close now, so you might be able to hear them. I hope you can't, but you might be able to hear them because they are quite close now. They're making a lot of noise. Sorry if you can. I uh, just hope we can kind of ignore them. This playback needs to stop. That's the worst thing right now. Oh my god, this fucking Danielle show thing is broken. Oh my god, can I stop it, please? Please. Can I play like a, a different one? Stop! Stop! Okay, I don't know why it spammed that line so many times. And there were some invisible walls present in this game, which was a little annoying, especially because I thought there were to be none in this game. But there were some outside the station and some inside, but also in the opening hour release of this game, the music did tend to drag on too long, but that was fixed before it reached the full game. Uh, one thing I also guess bugged me a little bit was that you couldn't aim down the sights of your weapon, but I guess if this game is trying to follow the rails of Bioshock and keep with the theme that you're a scientist, I guess that's not too big of a deal. There was something else that did bother me about this game, is that you could pay to make the game easier. You could buy this in-game starter kit with a shotgun, maybe a couple of other weapons and some ammo. I didn't look at it too extensively because I was completely uninterested in it because it was a microtransaction, but it did bother me that they had to try and squeeze microtransactions in there somehow. Right, now onto the serious stuff that will probably affect the rating of this game. The stuff before was little things that bugged me or too little to care that much about. Apart from maybe the microtransaction stuff. But anyway, one big thing that almost ruined the flow of this game for me was these little scripted encounters where you're supposed to encounter things for the first time. Like, for instance, the Technopath in the lift, which was supposed to be our first encounter, but I found them out on a spacewalk before that, which ruined the flow of the game completely. Because I got January talking to me about them as if I'd met them for the first time. I'm like, January, I've already killed like 10 of these. Okay, all right. That Typhon is an unknown type. From what I can tell, it's the source of the problem. Oh. The phantom you unleashed in 
psychotronics had similar disruptive abilities. Only this one seems more powerful. Scanning it would tell you more. You mean the nightmare? Tell it. There we go. I got you, didn't I? Nice work. The lift is responding again. That Typhon hijacked the hardware. Even the software running the system. Oh, this was where I was supposed to encounter the first technopath. it on the fly. Fascinating. This was supposed to encounter the technopath for the first time, the was it? Fine. Take the lift if you need to move quickly between the three main decks on Talos One. It gotcha. has to stop in the lobby and down in life support. All right, great. Now I can get to where I need to go to. All right, so that's that was supposed to be the first time I encountered the technopath, but I never fixed this on the way. Um, but that was supposed to be the first time I. I thought he was talking about the other thing. The glue gun, although a great tool, was also really glitchy sometimes. Whether it be plugging pipes, freezing enemies, or sucking up fires from oil spills, it was a great tool but could be extremely unreliable just when you didn't want it to be. There were also some little movement bugs in the game, like for instance when I got stuck between some pipes that I should have been able to just sit upon, it kind of left me for a sitting duck sometimes. The fact that you could get drunk in this game in an attempt to heal up or get rid of the fear status was a nice touch, but I wish it had been more of a hindrance. Like when you're drunk the game could have been more scary in those moments to try and revive the horror aspect. It just felt easy to control and wore off pretty quickly. But I feel if they wanted to amp up the horror aspect of that it could have been a more deadly state to be in. Like, the Typhon could have easily killed you when you were like that. One lore aspect of the game that I could criticise is that the Neuromods were used as upgrades in the game, but it would have been cool to have specific Neuromods for specific abilities. So like when you fetch the Lightner Neuromod for Igwe, it could have been called the Lightner Neuromod instead of just Neuromod. And you could have found like Neuromods specific for combat named after some war heroes of their time. Or maybe just give them the names of people in the perk list and then the description of what they do. Seeing as Neuromods is harnessing the abilities of other humans. And for future reference, I did plan to criticise the fact that there were no mirrors in the game to see yourself because you can see in the shadows on this game what awkward positions your character is in but I guess with the big ending reveal it kind of makes more sense now more on that later an enemy mechanic I felt that was maybe left out a little bit was with the telepaths because they would mind control these humans around them but when you attack the telepath the telepath wouldn't alert the other humans to attack and I don't know why they didn't do that because that could have made for some really good scenes. Like let's say you're in a ventilation system or some sort of tunnel and you find a telepath surrounded by humans almost nesting them. And this telepath spots you and then all the other humans turn and start running at you. I think that would have been an incredible scene. A little cliche but effective nonetheless. And again it could have amped up that horror aspect a little bit more. And now the point you've all been waiting for, the loading screens, yes. Now I don't often criticise games for their loading screens because it's almost always a very minute thing, but when they have them like they did in this game it can be extremely annoying. The loading screens were extremely frequent by visiting different areas of the station and they were really long. During one of the episodes I filmed for 40 minutes it ended up being much shorter through 15 minutes of loading screens. That is definitely one thing I won't miss about this game. And some of the times that the game tried to be emotional they were often cut short by me doing things unintentionally. Like in the escape pod with the cook, and I took the recycler charge off of the wall without even thinking about it, and it just cut out the whole scene for him for me. Morgan, you. <coughs> this part. We are over now. <laughs> yeah. What's funny? You can't get this thing to work. You've been hurt. Oh shit. Some Typhon hurt him. I didn't even do anything. I didn't even kill him. He just died. He just died. Well. Will Mitchell. Guess that's the end of you, huh? I didn't even do anything. I guess he got hurt by some Typhon on the way in. He just got got. And other important scenes with characters, like also at the ending scene with Alex and you know who. I don't want to spoil that too much because of my spoilers section, but my point is, the scenes in this game were easily ruined. And one big thing that got on my nerves was that you can miss a whole section of this game with Danielle Cho if you don't actively seek her out, which is important to the ending. So I unintentionally missed a huge character plot that was present in the game because of the lack of direction. 
It gave me no objectives, just I had to go and track her and find her on my own if I wanted to. And I didn't think about doing that because, oh, you know, I was trying to save the station. And it really ties in with my point about the scenes being cut short, because these scenes are completely missable. And it's definitely one of the factors bringing this game down and it will affect the rating. Okay, so now for the spoilers section. If you don't want to listen to this part, I will leave a timestamp right here where you can skip to if you want to play the game yourself and you don't want the story spoiled. But anyway, for those of you who don't care because you're not planning on playing the game or you don't mind it being spoiled, I have to talk about this story section because it's so crucial to the rating I'm giving and it affects the game in a big way. Some aspects of it are truly outstanding, but there are parts about it that bug me. So the whole point of this story was that it was a big test this whole time and you are a Typhon. More specifically, a Phantom and you have been restrained and been going through this playback of Morgan Yu's memories and they were testing you to see if they could truly coexist with the Typhon. They want to prove this because the whole journey of Morgan's memories was altered and he wasn't able to stop the invasion and the typhon made it to earth and they also show you pictures of earth which when i first saw them i thought oh no because it looked so grim but apparently it's paradise or something but anyway they want to infuse the typhon with human neuromods to have them become sentient and have an awareness and feelings including sympathy for others and the whole point of this test is to see if you are capable of compassion and sympathy and there are also a few operators and Alex himself surrounding you, all with voices of Michaela, Dr. Igwe, Sarah Elazar, and Danielle Cho. And they all comment on your actions during the simulation to advise Alex on whether he kills you or he takes your hand. So the first big question I've got is, when did Morgan's memory stop? And when did the fake reality begin? What part of it was fake? What part of it was real? Did Morgan kill all those Typhon that we did? Or did he perish instantly with everyone else? It's kind of sad and it kills off the brave hero vibe we got from Morgan. Is he even alive? It just made our hero feel that he was almost a fabrication and he didn't matter. Another thing is the game emphasizes that if you choose the Typhon abilities it's a bad thing, but in the ending it's completely pointless. It doesn't factor into the ending at all, but under the guise that I was Morgan I thought it would be that I could either blow up the station or kill all Typhon. But if I had Typhon abilities too then that meant that I'd be killed too because I had too much Typhon DNA in me. I thought we'd go a bit along the Mass Effect ending route, but a bit better, of course. So again, I missed out on a lot of these abilities because I thought it mattered, but it didn't, and it just took so much content away from me. And the third point I have is that I was surprised by Danielle Cho being there at all. Because as I said earlier, it's completely possible to miss her during the game, and I already talked about that. And the fourth negative I have is that was Dio, Igwe, Danielle, or any of the other operators ever real? Or were they characters imported into the hallucination? I just really wish they would have been more clear on a lot of things here. There were also supposed to be memories or signs throughout the campaign, which were these little hot flashes that this whole thing was a hallucination. But I thought it was just the Typhon trying to communicate to us. And plus it only happened three times during my playthrough anyway, so it didn't seem like anything significant. And there were many loose ends and questions created by this ending and not much in the way of answers. Including the picture everyone was having nightmares about in that test. I was disappointed they went nowhere with that so I thought the test would point to somewhere during the ending. I thought that the fat man represented Alex and the train was the station and that the people tied to the track were the scientists. I thought I had to kill Alex to try and save everyone or something like that. I'm just disappointed that they left that off. And the main reason I titled my last Prey video Was Any Of It Real was because I was genuinely confused as to what parts of it were real or not. However, despite all this, the ending did kind of make sense and it makes you see the whole journey as almost a trial for your actions, a bit like Bioshock 2. And you can choose to coexist with humanity and become like them or you can kill them regardless. So overall I think the choice in this game was very present, definitely one of the better choice games out there and especially with games pretending that your choice affects the story at all in some cases. Because there are definitely some games out there that pretend you have a choice but you don't. So for a true rating despite all of the stuff I mentioned in the criticism section this game still gets a 7 from me. It's still a very good game despite all of its flaws I mentioned here, but I just think it lacked on horror and some of the loose ends created by the story and some of the glitches in it prevent it from reaching those higher numbers like 8, 9 and 10. I wanted to give this game an 8, but I am reminded of all the flaws that bring it down when I try and give it that rating. 
It's still definitely a good experience and you'll have fun with it. I just think it maybe needs something like Mass Effect did where they introduced this huge DLC to patch some plot holes. I think Prey probably needs to run something like that because there are so many unanswered questions. Should you buy it? Yeah, I would still recommend it to people, but not without bringing up how much the story sucks in certain places. But don't forget, this game's atmosphere does really well for itself in places, like the whole life before death thing. And to conclude, this game is very good, but it just lets itself down in so many places. I think we're going to need some more answers before I could even consider giving this game a higher rating. So anyway, thank you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed this blue review. If you liked it, leave a like. If you want to see more, subscribe. I've been Dr. Blue, you've been my audience, and I'll see you guys next time. I'm blue, I'm blue.